I, I can't <laughs> change it. I can't control it. Um, I mean, I see the Bible calls to live by the Spirit. Right. Spirit. If it convicts you, don't do it. If it doesn't. But then, is it is it a sin or not? Because then it convicting one person is not convicting them. That's, That's why we can't get dogmatic on something that is not clear. Right. right. But we could get dogmatic <laughs> on that which is clear, which is not to be a stumbling block. Right. And, which you'll see. The scripture that says to stay away from the very appearance of evil. You're going to see some things in here that's going to be like, huh. I mean, there's more scripture in the Bible about not drinking alcohol than there is on other things. Can I hit you with one since nobody's listening to us? No, we're live. Oh, we're live again. <laughs> Remember, tell me after. Okay. But yeah, there's a, I was, when I read that book, I was just like, Wow, there's so much information. And even the pastor that sent it to me, he says, I don't believe everything in, in this. He goes, but it's a good tool. He goes, just look at it. He goes, there's a lot of things in there. And there was. There's some things I was like, oh, oh yeah. Like, if I didn't understand it, I must not Because I'm not going to try. It's going to come up in the class, right? Yes. Probably. Good evening. How's everybody doing? <coughs> this... This is something that was, um, actually, it's been something my whole life. You know, we've always been told, growing up, you know, don't drink, not to drink, drink, not to drink. Different denominations, religions and stuff say it's okay. Some don't. Free Will Baptist is totally against it. We know that. That's in the treaties. That's in everything. But nobody's ever said why. So I did a study on this. I, had a, I got with a good preacher friend of mine that is a very good history buff, I would say, um, that mailed me two books. One was on the fermentation process on biblical times, which, whew, I read half of it and I had to stop because I was so confused. There's things in there that I'll never do, never understand. And then this other book was just phenomenal. And then I had another pastor in our conference give me a bunch of information that they did with their fifth graders at their academy on why not to drink and stuff. But this is what I tell people. I understand the Holy Spirit does convict people differently, but we're gonna have, we're gonna look at several verses tonight that could tie into why in today's time we should stay away from it. Um, yes, it is used for medicinal purposes. That's still fine because in a lot of our medicines that we take, it's in there. Uh, a lot of people cook with it, but when you cook with it, you cook the alcohol totally out. And it's just the flavor that you get. But you got to remember this, some of this is back in biblical times, not in today's time. So we'll go through it. This is not going to just be tonight. Um, I know the next two Wednesday nights, uh, Brother Nelson is going to do a Bible study. And then we'll pick up on this again because I've got so much information that I probably have two more PowerPoint things to do. Because I don't want to leave you just hanging with what we do tonight. Okay, so I want you to... But this first... Um, scripture in Romans 13 13 it says let us walk honestly as in the day not in rioting or drunkenness not in chambering or wantonness not in strife or envy um, this is a, this is one thing that that I know a lot of people might not agree with <coughs> that's fine because none of us have the right to judge each anybody because we're not God um, but also be careful reading into scripture to make it what you want it to be because that's not how the Bible was written um, we can take something and interpret it this way because we're living this way and we want to say it's okay it's not okay sin is sin the Bible clearly says in James for him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin um, but what this is, is just basically some things that we're going to go through. Um, the Bible does teach total abstinence from alcohol. There are verses throughout the Bible. But you can pick them out and do what you want with them. You know, that's what you got to be careful with doing as well. And then we're going to look at the main word, the main Hebrew word for wine. And in Greek, they can either mean fermented grape juice or intoxicating wine. But you got to realize back in biblical days... It was different than what we have today. Okay, and I'll explain that when we get further along. And then the English word for wine has two meanings also. It could be either unfinished, 
unfermented juice or alcoholic drink. So let's look at what wine is in the Hebrew. That word is tyrosh. I guess that's how you pronounce it. T-I-Y-R-O-W-S-H. In Hebrew, I mean in the Old Testament, it means freshly pressed grapes. New wine, not fermented. Okay, they just pressed them and they're drinking it. That's what that means in the Old Testament. Now, if you see the, the if it's used to be old wine or intoxicating wine or to mean drunk, it's yayin. I think it's Y-A-Y-I-N. Okay, that's the Hebrew word for wine when it's talking about being drunk, fermented, stuff like that. So it just depends on how it's used within that verse will be the what type of Hebrew word it is. Now remember, once the grapes were pressed back in biblical times, it took approximately six hours for it to ferment. They did not have the fermentation process that we have today. Okay? It took six hours. One thing you've got to realize most of the wine in biblical times was diluted because they didn't have a lot okay there wasn't a lot of you can take notes if you want this i just bring me a thumb drive and i'll give you a whole powerpoint it's up to y'all if but just jot down what you want but we got to realize too the water was not the type of water we have today They're, they had nothing to cleanse their water to make their water distilled and nice and so you got to realize to get drunk in biblical days, you had to drink a lot, I mean gallons, in order for you to get drunk. Because the fermentation process is totally opposite of what we have today. There are 75 scriptures within the Bible that warns or condemns the use of alcoholic beverages. 75 throughout the old and the new. Now, when God approves wine, this this book, and I was trying to find this, and, and the reason I believe this is God cannot sin and will not sin, okay? He's not going to cause anybody to sin. God cannot do that. That's against his attribute, his nature, and everything. When he approves of wine, normally it's not going to be fermented. Some people may disagree. Some may say, well, what about Jesus turning over? We'll get to that in a second, okay? But the thing was is, God's not going to cause somebody to sin. He's not going to give them something to sin. He does not do that. Now, verses that expose the evils of wine are always going to be talking about the intoxicating wine, the ones that that there. And if we look at Proverbs 20, verse 1, it says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Okay, think about it like that. Um, I know we've, we, there's people that, and I've heard it said, and I myself said it once, but I don't drink, is, oh, wine's good for the heart. There's also other things you can do that's not alcoholic to make your heart better. Okay, so there's always some, that's what I'm saying. If that was the only way, then I guess it would be all right, but it's not. The Bible says alcoholic drink is evil. It is not just the amount one drinks that makes drinking a sin. God also condemns it himself. There is more scripture condemning the use of alcoholic beverages in the Bible than there are on subjects of lying, adultery, swearing, cheating, hypocrisy, pride, or even blasphemy. So I think there's a, there's a reason that's in there. So there's got to be somebody that messes it up, I guess you could say. But you got to think about it. There's, there's a lot in this. Now, this, this book went into five reasons to abstain from it, and we're, we're going to get into it is, one, the first and most vital point to be understood is that this list of forbidden and ungodly activities to be avoided by believers is not fixed or static. I mean, it's not the same as it was back then as it is now, okay? Circumstances will change it. Things will change. You've got to remember, this Bible was written to them. It wasn't written to us. It's written for us, okay? So when this was written, it was written at that time, at that culture, at that place. But it's also written for us to learn from. Activities will fall into one or two categories, either good or bad, which is also righteous or unrighteous. 
And then activities are going to change depending on circumstances. Depending on where they're at in the Bible, what's going on in the Bible at that time. Uh, the Old Testament, when it talks about wine, is totally different than the New Testament. Okay, it, it totally changes, and, and that's only within a, a matter of hundreds of years. I mean, it, it, so you got to look at it like that as well. So when right, this is the first reason. When does right become wrong? So when we look at Deuteronomy 14, verse 26. It says, And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink. There's a difference. That wine's not fermented. Or for whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice thou in thine household. Remember, this was for those people in Deuteronomy at that time. Okay? But they also did... Thing. And it kept getting worse. The children of Israel never listened, never did what they were told to do and what not to do. So that wine that said here is when it says wine and then it goes on to say strong drink, there's two different. Okay, there's two different kinds. The activities may change the categories. Now, and here's an example how things change. Look at dancing. Okay. Dancing is another activity that may change from good to bad. We all know that David danced before the Lord. That was great. Nothing wrong with it whatsoever. But what does our culture do with it today? Dancing is designed to be a means of sensual and sexual exhibitation and arousal. Dirty dancing, twerking. You got little tiny girls wearing hardly nothing, going to these dance classes and dance studios, and the mom's putting all this makeup. Have not the pedophiles increased? Have not we had more child molest? Think about the culture. Think about the change. Dance was not wrong. We made it wrong to a point. Okay, see what I'm saying? Things, things can be taken and made wrong. When does right become wrong? See, that, that's one of the examples they put in. They put other examples of slavery and stuff like that in there. I didn't go into that one. But this is, we should ask if certain activities are morally acceptable, do they conform to the Ten Commandments? And the other definitions of righteousness within the Bible. That's what we should ask ourselves. Is this right? If we have to ask, then we already know it's wrong. That's what I've always been told in my life. If you have to ask somebody if you can do this or should do this or is this okay, then you already know the answer is wrong. You're trying to get somebody to tell you it's okay. Under that same reason, 1 Corinthians 6.12 says this. All things... Are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Notice the end of that verse. Okay, this is one reason they believe abstinence. Alcohol becomes over you if you consume. I don't care what anybody says. One drink messes with your your metabolism. It messes with your thinking. It messes with your functioning. It's been proven. That's not good. And will not be brought under the power of any. Anything that's evil should not be brought that power over you. Now there's, yeah, we overeat. We do other things. Yeah, and we pay for that too. Preachers, I might need to do a thing on gluttony. I don't know. Preachers, <laughs> preachers don't preach on that much. But you got to think about it. People get drunk drinking alcohol. They do not get drunk drinking grape juice. They might get sick if they drink too much. Their, their, their sugar may go up and they could, you see what I'm saying? But you have to ask yourself on anything. It does not just mean drinking. Will the activity have some mastery over you? If it's going to control you, then it's not good unless it's God. If you allow God and the Holy Spirit to have control over you, that is totally fine. But anything other than that is a sin. Because God bought us with a price, with his son's blood, and that's who we should allow. Now Paul asked that the activities edify, if they build up sanctification, knowledge, and strength. The basis of abstinence for Christians is that alcohol drinks have moved from the category of beneficial in the Old Testament times Okay, there was benefits to it. They had to have it for certain things. Even in the New Testament, with me and uh, 
Nelson, we're talking before about the time where Paul tells Timothy, a little wine for thy stomach, you know, because he had a condition. That's fine. But then later on, the category of grossly harmful and evil in later centuries, it changes. You know, we're not under that culture back then. We have different medicines now that can help us. Some medicines still have, like if you take NyQuil, it has a, some percentage of alcohol in it. Al alcoholics that can't get alcohol, I've known this from, from the, my job, they will drink mouthwash that has alcohol. Now, they got some pretty good breath to be homeless. But they have to drink a lot of it to get drunk, and they do. That's how it became mastery over them. They would have never took the first drink of alcohol. They wouldn't know what it tasted like. They wouldn't know what it altered their system and made them. We have to think about like that too. You know, if we never do the first thing, then don't worry about it. You're never going to have to do it. But the development of the liquor industry has unleashed a massive and cruel tidal wave of human tragedy and misery across the world. It now markets with compelling effectiveness. Watch some of those commercials of how they put this out there. Vast quantities of alcohol is far higher strengths now than it ever was in biblical times, ever. Remember, they didn't have the, the capability of making it like they do today, okay? And they put it out there. If you watch any ad involving alcohol, there is something sexual in nature in that ad. I mean, there is every single time. You've got to think about it. And, it, and it's sad. It has become a psychoactive mood affecting addictive drug and we have to ask the prescribed biblical question this is it good is it profitable is it beneficial does it edify or is it really just unnecessary harmful and enslaving some people are going to say well i can control it okay i'll bring a quick um input because we use it for taking the Lord's Supper. I mean, the most, most, I'm not I'm saying right. most churches do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm going to stay with the strong side of the subject, not with the weak side. Well, in another way, the weak side is the arguable side. Right. So I'm going to stay with the strong side of the, uh, the subject, which is God always call, calls us to be sober, a sober mind. Uh, so a person that's influenced by alcohol cannot be sober. Not only alcohol, but any type of drugs. Not only drugs, but food. Mm -hmm. So as the pastor was talking about uh, the sin of gluttony, yep. it's, not it's not dealt with as if it was smaller or bigger when the Bible says that those that practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So I'm sure God is not giving... Uh, the size measurement when it comes to saying you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's, that's good enough for me to know that I'm not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so so Briar is key point for because a lot of people will focus on can you, can you not? Is it a sin? Is it not a sin? Well, that becomes all arguable. But the, what's not arguable is the Bible calls us to sobriety. That's not arguable. Okay. The Bible says uh, in Ephesians 4.30, uh, do not be, no siempre que conviene. Anybody speak Spanish in English here besides me? Oh. Uh, <laughs> let me look for it. Let me look for it. You said Ephesians 4 what? 430. Uh, 4.30. No, that's actually the one that says get full, but then right there, a few verses before. Well, 4.30 says grieve not the Holy grieve Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Right, and one of the few, one of the after ones says, uh, has to do with being sober. Uh, since you're there, anyway, I don't want to kill the pastor's time, but I know sobriety is a key element. Another key element is holiness. The Bible says, without holiness, no one will see God. And another key element is to not be a stumbling block, as me and the pastor were talking. Those three elements. A Christian cannot get away from those three elements are non-negotiable. Those three elements are scripturally in black and white, so clear that they cannot be argued. And like he was talking about with the Lord's Supper, 
I know a certain religion, Catholicism, they only use wine. Okay? And they also say it's okay to drink because I know I have some friends that are Catholics that that's what they do. They said, all I, all I got to do is go this, this, and pray to, and then I, and I'm thinking that's, but they also believe in purgatory, which is not even in the Bible. It's not, there's no such thing. So you got to be careful, you know, just because somebody says it's okay, line it up with the word of God. And like he said, he gave you three verses that can kill any other argument whatsoever, because that's what God said. But we're going more in depth of why, like today's culture, with what this does, why we should stay away from it. One, it's very addictive. Now, yes, I can, and, and I probably will, because you know what? We can look at the gluttony part and all that one day, but right now we're focused on just alcohol. But it's addictive. Why? Because it takes mastery over you. It becomes a master over you because you got to have, it could be like that with any kind of drug. <clears throat> Any kind of over-the-counter drug, people get addicted to over-counter drugs too. I mean, and it's not it's not right. Those drugs are there for a reason, and God allowed man to make them for a reason, but they got to be used correctly. Some people don't like to take them. I know when I had to have certain surgeries, I didn't take the heavy. I just couldn't do it because it made me feel, and I just couldn't do it. But some people they have no choice because there's so much pain, so it's there to help. But it's only there for a little bit. You can't abuse it. It is also heavily impl implicated, and I know this for a fact, that half of all recorded crimes, including half of murders, child abuse, and wife batterings, all have some type of alcohol abuse involved. Okay? If the person wasn't on drinking, they probably would not have done that stuff. Can't say they would or wouldn't, but it influences your thinking. It influences everything that your body has that God told you to be sober, to be vigilant. Once you put something that's mind-altering in your body, to me, I don't believe that that's right. I don't believe that that's, we can say that that's not a sin. It is. There are other ways that you can do something that calms you. You don't have to come home from a bad day and slug down a beer or wine to calm you. There's other things that God has put into place that can help us problem is is some choose to do other things we got to look has there been any major changes in its nature availability and usage since the approval and moderation of biblical times yes it's crazy billion dollar industries now with alcohol my I remember growing up my dad used to tell me that Publix never sold it at one point Publix didn't have it in their stores and then they started getting it you know, and then, then, it, then it's like, it's everywhere. There's a reason they call it spirits. Yeah. I can, I can remember when no, no, no grocery store had beer. None. They just had no. to, It's, and, and like he said, that's the reason they call it spirits. Huh? Hard liquor sold in the county back in the 50s. You had to go to Osceola County or, or outside south to buy hard liquor. And the funny thing is where they make, uh, I think it's Jack Daniels. That's a dry county or whatever. You can't, you can't like drink it outside or anything. They say when you go there, if you take a tour, because yeah, it's uh, in, in Kentucky, they they dry counties makes the yeah they make like that's 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 crazy yeah. But the principle of Christian abstinence is based on the massive gulf between the alcoholic drinks of biblical times and the mind-altering, destructive power of today's gigantic industry. So that was reason one why we abstain. When does right become wrong? Second one is weakness of the wine. Remember, the highest achievable alcohol content in wines produced in biblical times never went over 14% fermented. They had no way. It didn't last. They had nothing that could keep it or make it like they do today. You know, so you had to drink a lot to get drunk back in the biblical days. 14% is fine. Right. But very rare that anybody had that because they had nothing to keep it in. And the reason why, well, I know it's going to be coming up shortly. Wine was not fermented anywhere near the ceiling because of the unpleasant taste. They said it's kind of like vinegar. Yeah. Whenever they got fermented, it was kind of like drinking vinegar. That's why they had to dilute it so bad. They didn't have all the other stuff like we have today to add to it to make it sweet, to make this taste like this. 
all these flavorings that we've created today. They didn't have all that back in biblical times. So you have to think it's totally different. The common wines of the Palestine were fermented for only three to four days compared to six months with the Greeks. While the exact strength is not known, the indications are that they were extremely weak. I guess the Greeks knew what they were doing. That's when they came up with all the Greek gods, you know? <laughs> like spirits, they got all drunk. Oh, we got Zeus now. No, come on. Well, I know that for a fact because I used to make homemade wine, and it takes at least three months. Yeah, it's Thanks. not something you can just do overnight. You know, no. a lot of people think. Um, they have a thing called... Let me tell you something about the Greeks. Uh -huh. They have an alcoholic drink called Uzo. Mm -hmm. They catch it to the tongue. You throw it down two or three shots, you don't walk. <laughs> it's that strong. It's the same as torpedo juice. It was 190 proof alcohol. And the guys got to drinking it on the ships. We had to put croton oil in it to keep them from drinking it. And they called it Pink Lady. And they tried to strain the stuff out of it. <laughs> mastery. It goes back to not having something mastery over you, you know? People are going to do what they want to do. I mean, this 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 might not stop anybody from drinking. This might tell people, "Oh, I don't care." Man will do what's right in their own eyes. The Bible says it clearly. Okay, but I'm just giving you biblical things and going to show you some verses here in a little bit that really goes to it. But back in those days, must M U S T, that's the juice of the grape which begins to ferment right after it's pressed out. That's what they call the must. You know, and they had it in the biblical days. If it was left in open jars, they left it out in vats because they wanted to go undergo the Arabic fermentation. In Palestine, it was only for a few days. Another thing that they did the next stage was an Arabic stage, meaning they tried to shut off all air and oxygen to it. The only problem they had with that is that the porous containers and the poor stoppers that they used could not let them do that very long. They didn't have glass jars like we have today. They had stuff that was porous, stuff that had that it would seep out. The common wine of ancient Palestine was no doubt intoxicating when it was drank in quantities. But it was an exceptionally weak product by today's standard. They said estimated to be between 2% or 4%. And even this was probably diluted. That's what they, from thing, records that they found and things that they've seen back in biblical, remember, biblical times, not today. Pretty sure you can go over to Palestine and get drunk. They probably have the, the stuff today that everybody else has. But look at Revelations 14.10. The same shall drink of wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. We're going to come back to that into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb so if we look at this verse this verse strongly implies that wine was normally drunk diluted and this is, and it goes by the meaning is that in hell God's wrath will be undiluted he's not going to have his mercy or his grace for people that are in hell not diluted. It's real. It's right there. But this is what it says. It said it would not have been necessary to stress without mixture if the people did not think of wine as a beverage normally diluted. So in biblical days when they drank alcohol, it was diluted. Not like we have today. You ain't going to see nobody diluted today. It gets warm. They don't even drink the rest of it. I, I always, I mean, when, it, when you go around and you see people with it, you don't never see them drink a warm bottle of beer always got to be cold always got to have it. and I'm just like I don't, know, I don't know how they can do it I, I as a kid I got tricked by my brothers because they told me it was something else when I drank it out of a glass and oh it made me sick I spit it out I'm like how do you do that I'm like in a glass it looks like somebody used a restroom in the glass <laughs> and they just drinking it and I, I, I don't know but here's the third reason the shortage of wine. In biblical times, wine was not only weak, but it was not particularly plentiful either. 
Okay, they didn't have like we have today where you can just go to a store and buy it or, or make it. Or It was very hard to get. Now, we all know the story of Jesus turning water into wine. Weddings in those days lasted at least a week, possibly longer. They said that there could easily be 500 guests sharing 1,440 pints of wine, which is about six 30-gallon pots that they had for this feast. That's like everything they had. At this particular wedding in John chapter 2, the guests ran out of wine a little too quickly. So that's why Jesus performed the miracle. Listen, these people couldn't go to the next town over because everybody from that town was at this wedding. They had everybody in the whole area. Now this chapter was not has no indication that the wine was fermented in any way. John chapter 2, the way that word is used for wine... Many scholars cannot prove if it was fermented or not. I go back to like what Nelson was saying with those three scriptures and being that Jesus is God and cannot sin, that it was not fermented. And the reason I was, I didn't, yeah, I want to show you something on, on this real quick. John 2 verse 9. The reason why I, I look at it as that it was not is the simple fact that when Jesus did this, in verse 7, it says, Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear, meaning give him something to drink. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, he had no clue what it was. He had been drinking wine the whole night. How does he not know what this is? But he said he, said he preserved the best he right. preserved the best one all the way to the end, meaning he was the fresh press, the the one that, like you said, the undiluted. The undiluted, fresh, the, the best the, stuff. It was wine. I, I would even dare to say that it was wine in the sense that it wasn't grape juice, some people would want to say. Right. But the content, the, the, the if we want to, if we want to quantify the amount of alcohol in it, it will take a lot of tremendous amount of drink. We have a drink in Puerto Rico it's called Mavi, similar to that. Because we do fermenting. But man, you have to drink like 10 gallons of those to get, to get drunk. It's fermented, but it won't get you drunk. Well, during this time, this wedding at this time occurred in mid March. So it was four months before the next grape harvest. So two thirds of the way through the year, and they ran out of wine. This host of this wedding ran out of wine. Now, remember, this is biblical times. There's a reason. To run out of wine was more than embarrassing. It broke the strong, unwritten laws of hospitality. Meaning, things could have gotten bad. People could have started fighting, hurting one another, killing one another because they ran out of wine. So Jesus performed a miracle. To, I believe in my heart, one, to keep peace, one to start showing who he was but I don't believe it was the stuff that people were just going to start getting drunk on because reading it and even in the next chapter it doesn't really go into saying that anybody got drunk but everybody wants to use Jesus turned water into wine because they see the word wine and they automatically assume it's what we have today and it's not it was not they don't have the capability back then to do what we had today Jesus could have but I don't believe he did because he can't sin alcohol has always held danger and it has always been drunk in excess oh don't do that to me where's I at there it is without doubt alcohol has become a mighty force in society it stimulates crime inflames passions it wrecks lives encourages unbelievable heartlessness and cruelty and it claims millions to the bondage of addiction tell me how that is okay it's not it's not. This is reasons we don't drink. People say, I can control. Well, that's fine. Do what you feel you can do when you stand before God and have to give an account. In 1980, the cost of Britain's drinking, taking account of alcohol-caused sicknesses and abstinence from work, unemployment, health costs, police and court costs, this is 1980 in Britain, was an astounding $2 billion a year. That's in 1980. 
I wonder what it would be today. It says 28,000 people died prematurely with alcohol-related illnesses, and up to a million people suffered serious harm socially and physically because of alcohol misuse. That was in Britain in 1980. I wonder what that statistic would be today, and even here. Probably double. At least. So we have to ask this. Does drink with its associations now come into the category of the unfruitful works of darkness with which the Christian should have no fellowship. Can I read a couple of verses? Mm -hmm. so, the, I found it. Ephesians 5. It says, um, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. That's, a, that's the verse that I was looking for. It wasn't four. It was chapter mm -hmm. five. It's just next one over. Yeah, just one over. <laughs> Not to be drunk with wine. Yeah. Jen, what, why does the government allow this thing? You know what I mean? Um, so money. They, money. Money. They money. make so money. much money. Money. So just they like they approved, the, some states approved marijuana. Marijuana. Sale. marijuana. Abortion. Oh, money. Abortion. Money. It's all money. Cigarettes. Tax. Money. The, the love of money is the root of all evil. All evil. evil. Okay. The second question uh -huh. is then, you know, the, uh, they, it's money, but the, just like cigarette smoking, um, you know, they got sued and stuff, uh, you know, for the damage it did to the people, the addiction and stuff. How come it's not the same with, like, warning lanes on cans? You know, this is an addictive product. Uh, uh, drunk drivers kill innocent people. You know what I mean? It should be on the cans because and they should be responsible. Budweiser, all those companies. Well, they put it in their commercials now, if you notice. Drink responsibly. There's no responsibly in drinking. If you don't take the first sip, you won't have that possibility of doing all these things. But I see what you're saying. I don't know why. I, it's, I guess every state's different. Um, it's yeah, just it well, they want to say now if you buy a gun, they want to go back and get the gun dealer. It's they want to go back and get all the people sell the liquor yeah. and cigarettes. It's uh, and now they're even making shows on it, moonshining shows. I'm like, really? We're we're publicizing this, making it okay. But the Bible says in the last days things were going to change. The fermented wines and all other alcoholic drinks have surely crossed from the category of beneficial to the category of unnecessary, cruel. And insidiously harmful. We are compelled to ask, what business can a Christian have in subscribing to the consequences of such an industry? How can we say it's okay? I mean, if, if we truly claim to be a born-again Christian, as Nelson brought those three verses up, how can we say this is okay? That's what, and this is where I tell, it's between you and God. The Bible says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I know this is not going to be something I struggle with. I have other struggles. We all have struggles. I have a brother growing up in my life has, was an alcoholic. Today, to this day, I've been told he still is. Beer is his choice. When we were younger, he ended up hitting my mom before my dad got home. I mean, it, it's I know what alcohol does. There's nothing good from it. The only thing good from it is when I go to a restaurant and I can get some battered onion rings or something that had it cooked out. That's probably it. Other than that, no. There's nothing good from it. I've been in law enforcement 26 years. I have yet to see alcohol help somebody, make somebody strong. I, I, I've yet to see it. I've seen only the worst. If you prove to me different that it's a good thing, but trust me, I've seen too many people dead because of alcohol-related things and alcohol being part of it. Um, you get somebody that's drunk, put them in the back of my patrol car, and they end up using the restroom in the back of my patrol car. So, oh, why? Because that stuff's in their body that's not supposed to be. They can't tell me that's okay. And all these people waking up with hangovers the next morning. Oh, they're, they're hu hugging the porcelain god that everybody calls it. There, there's too much. And this is one thing I was going to show you. Another one. The boundaries of alcohol. In Proverbs 31, listen to what it says. The words of King Lemuel. I guess that's how you pronounce his name. The prophecy that his mother taught him. What, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what, the son of my vows. 
Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Lest they drink and forget the law, and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. That's basically talking about people that are sick. You know, there's people that need stuff that at times. I mean, growing up as a kid, I ain't going to lie to you. My dad at one time, oh gosh, it was the worst thing ever. When we had a bad cough, we had to take a swig of brandy. I about wanted to throw up. My cough went away, but I was, oh, never. I said, no, there's got to be something better that they have at the store than that. <laughs> Lemon and honey works very well, just to let y'all know. Can I say something about yeah, that? You know, I, this is a very controversial. And if we're going to look at it from uh, objectively speaking, from a, an a, not an exegetical, not putting into the, into the Bible what we wanted to say, but getting out of the Bible what it says, exegetical. This is a very controversial issue. But there's nothing controversial about the fact that what is alcohol meant to do? Isn't it, isn't, it, isn't it meant to make you feel good? Isn't it meant to put you at ease? Isn't it meant to get you away from problems and troubles? And isn't it, you know, isn't it escapist? That's what it is. Man, if, you know, I, I know that sometimes we don't want to sound holier than thou. But, man, if you really met Jesus, <laughs> you wouldn't need all that. You won't need that. You know, if you really met Jesus, you will have accomplished, you have felt, you have sensed the highest of the highest high. That's just my opinion. <laughs> I like your opinion. Verses 6 and 7, it prescribed strong, strong drink as an appropriate medicinal aid to relieve those dying in agony. Because remember, back in biblical times, they didn't have medicines like we have today. Okay? If you're dying, you, you either suffer or something. This is what they're saying. And also to suppress the mental torment of those suffering from suicidal depression. But the manner in which these recommendations were made shows that mood affecting levels of alcohol were not approved for ordinary use. Kind of like medicine. You know, that's when it wasn't used. I mean, it's not for something like he said, go every day. You should get high on the Holy Spirit. You should get high on Jesus. You know, that's the best high. Because why? You, you don't have any withdrawals. You don't have all those problems. Proverbs 23, 20 says, Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. I mean, wine bibbers were heavy drinkers of wine. So how different all this is from our culture today when the values have become reversed. So let's look at this one. This is one a lot of people might not agree or like, but these are all scriptures. Ephesians 5, 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. The Bible says stay away from the very appearance of evil. Okay, I just gave you just a taste of what the evil that can come from alcohol. Okay, yes, it doesn't always happen. Majority of the time, it does. Okay, we live in a society that it's okay. We must be careful what we do. Just because you may not be convicted may not mean that it's not wrong or that it doesn't hurt so much. A lot of times we will read into what we want it to be so it's okay for us to do something that we know is wrong. Okay? And th that's the one thing to think about. Only thing we can protect is our witness. Okay? If we lose our witness, we, we normally are going to be done. There's nothing you can do to invite somebody to church or to Christ if you lose your witness. And in Romans 12, 9, it says, Let love be without dissimulation. Adhere that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. So I looked up that word abhor. That's what it's, how you pronounce it. This word, it does not describe the character of something, but its effect. Okay, Something may be normally acceptable or morally neutral. But if it is harmful, damaging consequences, then it is evil in its effect. A drug is being directed against God's highest gift, the reason. When you drink, your reasoning is gone. It's going to be affected. I don't care if you take just a sip. 
Medicines will also affect your reasoning. That's why you have to be careful. That's why they tell you a lot of them that they give you, don't drive. Don't do this and don't do that because it affects your reasoning. But if we choose to just, for no reason, because we just like to drink, that's wrong because it's going to affect the greatest gift God's given us, which is the reason. The word abhor means to shudder away from, while the Greek word used here for evil means damaging or harmful. There's effects. There's effects to it. Remember, I've always said, we all have choices. We all make choices every day. There can only be two outcomes from a choice. You're going to reap the benefits or suffer the consequences. That's it. There's no other avenue from a choice that we make. And we all make those choices. First, uh, this is the one scripture I was saying about. First Thessalonians 5.22 Abstain from all appearance of evil. Okay? That's, I mean, that, some people might think it's not evil. Look at the damage and effects from it. It is. Stay away from the, even the appearance. Evil also means harmful and damaging. In today's, or is today's alcohol culture acceptable to God? Which side is it on? The Lord's side or the devil's side? Who's using it for good? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's using it for his own thing. And we got to remember, evil, the word means profoundly immoral or wicked, profound immortality or wickedness, especially when regarded as a supernatural force. That's why we always say that Satan is evil. To remain distant and separate from the tools and weapons of Satan is vital to our calling and our testimony. Remember, the devil has that out there to mean for bad. God has uses for that, and it is used, like I said, for medicinal purposes, but it's not in the, you know, it's, it's prescribed. It's certain things, you know, but we are not to be out there just because once you do that, it, it destroys your witness. Here's another thing. Are alcoholic drinks expedient? Are they fitting or appropriate for the testimony of the believer in the light of all the changes which have taken place and the role which alcohol now plays in our society. It's not like it was. You don't read in here where they were having commercials on TV in Deuteronomy. You know what I'm saying? It was different in those cultures. And today they've made it even worse. They, they've went... I mean, the same thing, we could go back to Sodom and Gomorrah talking about homosexuality. Yes, it was back then. Look at how more predominant it is today telling you we're, we're getting closer and closer to the end will alcoholic drinks bring us under the power to any degree yes they will they will pull you in and they will have power over you you won't be able to think for yourself you won't be able to do anything does alcoholic drinks actually edify do they uplift and encourage people <laughs> they give them liquid courage that don't last very long I've heard that before do they impart any benefit as the pleasant sanctuary or sanitary drinks of olden times did or do they now affect the mood and personality of those who drink placing believers at risk blunting their testimony and drawing them to support encourage and condone an evil industry think about it and here's a scripture that that um i love the way that they used it let me get to it real quick Philippians 4.8. Oh, I got it written right here. Listen to what Philippians 4.8 says. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So here's the question. Are today's strongly intoxicating alcoholic drinks honest? Or are they mood injuring tools of unreality? What happens when it's on your system? Every problem that you just try to drink away is still there. Everything you just did is still there. Is it honest? Are they just or do they tamper with mental judgment and discernment? Questions to ask. Are they pure or may they inflame and arouse fallen passions? How many babies are made out of a drunken act and then killed from abortions? 
that if they never would have done it in the first place and got drunk and stuff, might not have had to kill a baby. Are they lovely, like love communicating, or are they selfish and taken in long, large quantities, quarrelsome and violent? So this is a verse we can put back towards anything, not just alcohol. Are they a good rapport, or do they have a bad reputation in the areas of moral conduct, intelligent thought, and human kindness? It's another thing to think about. And is there any virtue or praise putting taste considerations aside in their accomplishments. Any virtue or praise in somebody being drunk and acting a fool because they have alcohol in their system? I haven't yet to see it. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Listen, we are a distinct people and we are called to be separate from the world. Our testimony depends on our distinctiveness. Okay? We, we, it's, it's one of those things that it don't matter if your family did it. It don't matter if you've done it your whole life. It don't matter any of that. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. Just because a family member did it all their life doesn't mean it was right. You know, I, I'm paying for things that, like health-wise that my dad didn't take care of himself eating. You know, it was passed down, hereditary, and, I'm, and I got the same problems. We all pay for things that we, we can stop the cycle. Okay, we, we can stop the cycle. Now, in closing, I said this is part one because it's probably going to be two, maybe a third one. Depends on what I can get into. Alcohol is an essential part of a pleasure-worshipping society. They do what's right in their own eyes. Okay, there's nothing There's nothing good that comes out of it. If Satan's river of false hope, false consolation, false happiness, and false courage, that's what it is. You hear that liquid courage. Oh, I'm strong. Now I got alcohol. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I, there were times that I wished I would have videoed some of the people I dealt with when they were drunk. Because I had to go back to them like days later when they were sober to let them see how they acted and what they said and how they talked. Some of the things that came out of their mouth. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, if you were sober, you probably would not have done that. Because I knew some of these people personally. A believer may put in a word for the Lord here and there for years without making much impression. But the moment a drink is refused, that believer is noticed at once and never forgotten. I'll refuse it. You know? Here's some things to think about, and then we're going to close. Noah's feet were hardly dry off the ark before he was drunk, lying naked before his family. David's story of adultery and murder involved drinking alcohol as he got Bathsheba's husband drunk as well. John the Baptist got his head cut off at a drunken birthday party. Alcoholism is not a disease. It is a choice. A disease is something that you catch. Okay? Alcoholism is not a disease. I'm tired of hearing people say it is because it's not. You can hear our government say alcohol is a disease. It's not. Drugs is a disease. disease. It's not. It's, it's an not. addiction. No. Alcoholism is an addiction, change, and bondage. Jesus is the only cure for any addiction. Listen, if you never took the first drink of alcohol, you'd never become an alcoholic. If you never swallowed the first pill or stuck yourself with a needle, you would have never become a narcotic. Same so it's not a disease. Same with cigarettes. Same thing with cigarettes. Same things with if we don't take care of ourselves eating properly. It's one of those things that it is a choice. It's not a disease. And if somebody ever tells you that, they're crazy. Prove to me it's a disease. It's not. A disease is something you catch, like the flu, you know, herpes. We probably get herpes because you're drinking, you know, <laughs> things like that. But alcoholism is an addiction. It's a choice. Listen, it is between you and God. I'm going to leave you with a couple quotes, which I thought was pretty cool. Abraham Lincoln said, alcohol has many defenders, but no defense. Think about that. And I love this Chinese proverb. 
First a man takes a drink, then the drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes the man. And I'll leave you with this until we do this again in several weeks. Morality is not determined by the opinions or the vote of the people. Morality is determined by the word of God. So even those three verses that Nelson talked about in the beginning should be enough. That stops a true believer of God. Now, I'm not, not, not going to say believer of God because you know what? The devil believes in God. doesn't mean he's going back to heaven. A true child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. One that doesn't meet the qualifications in Matthew 7, 21 and 23 where God's going to tell him, I never knew you. But one that is doing the will of God and living their best for God and striving to be like God. Their morality is going to be determined by the word of God. You've got to remember the fermentation process, totally different in biblical times than it was today. What we have today is sin. Just downright because it affects your mind and it takes power over you. We have to be careful. Now, like I said, I'll go back with the Bible says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I know to me, if I'm around people that I know claim to be a Christian and they drink around me, it offends me because I'm, I think it's wrong and I believe in my heart whole, wholeheartedly I have peace because I've never seen nothing good come from it and nothing from the world today can tell me it's good. So we have to also be careful not to be a stumbling block to our brother or our sister. Even to the point that if you go out with a friend and they're vegan and they don't like you eating meat in front of them, you're not supposed to. You know, just don't do it around, don't do it in front of them. You know, it's one of those things, because how are we different from the world if we look like the world, if we act like the world, and if we talk like the world? How are we peculiar? How have we been pulled out? We have to be different. We have to have a sober mind, like Brother Nelson was saying. If we're going to be drunk, be drunk in the spirit, not spirits, spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. There's only one. Okay, there's not several Holy Spirits, because those are evil spirits. So I hope this helped a little bit, because I, like I said, I know that like Nelson, it is, this is a very controversial topic, even within our own denomination of Free Will Baptist. There are some that believe it's okay. Listen, I'm not here to change anybody's opinion. I'm just here to give you the word of God and what it says. You take it, do what you feel confident and what you feel is okay. Just remember, the Bible says we will all give an account by ourselves with God. I just pray you're doing what's right. You know, the Apostle Paul dealt with many issues. And one of the one of the issues on the, in the early church was the circumcision. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. And that was a big issue with Paul and Peter in Acts, in the book of Acts. But I'm going to ship in what Paul felt about this situation when, when subjects like this one become an issue to believers. And how does Paul address this issue? He said, but if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Right. Okay. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you might do the things that you please. This is the reason why a lot of people argue for it or against it, because it pleases them. But if you are led by the spirit, as the pastor said, not the spirits, but the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissension, fancies, envy, and I'm going to finish with the one that we're talking about today, drunkenness. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh which its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. 
Let us not become boastful, challenging one another in these little subjects, and being one another. Just let's walk in the Spirit. Yep. Anybody got anything? Galatians 5.22 Is that the one that um, you, you can't get drunk off of? The, the love 5.22 Galatians 5.22 mm -hmm. And he was saying about the Lord Because all of this is lust, you know, the drinking, sexuality, all of that is lust. And if we lust in that, we know better than drinking alcohol. Well, the word lust is wanting something more. Right, it's a lust. And uh, yeah, and this right here, the fruit of the spirit, this is just, that's how you know if you're true, you know, by the fruit you bear, the love, the joy, the peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, you know, I mean, you can't do any of those without having a sober mind. There's no way. There's no way you're going to love somebody if you're drunk. Oh, I love you. They love everybody. They have joy for a little bit until they start coming down from it. It's, I mean, you know what I'm saying? People get that, um, they can die from what is it? Too much? I forgot what they call it. Having too much alcohol poisoning. You know, you think about it. You ain't going to have no peace with it. Never seen anybody have peace being drunk. Um, long suffering. They're going to suffer a long time <laughs> from being that way. And They're not gentle. They're not good. So yes, we're, to be drunk in the spirit, it's nothing wrong with that. has nothing to do with alcohol. That's not what that is. Right, drunk right. in the spirit is just being like, you know, people praise the Lord and, and hear and they're having a bad day, but they're just praising God. They're in the Spirit. Mm -hmm. The Spirit's in them, and they're letting it out. That's a total difference than what we this being drunk with alcohol. I mean, yeah, you get, I was trying to understand that all of that is still um, with the wine and stuff. It's still like. Like you said, it's our desire. You know, we chose to do that. Mm -hmm. And some people, they just fall for it so they can get the satisfaction from it. But they really don't have to be intoxicated for anything. It's just their desire. But you got to think about it. They always want more. They're never satisfied. So then it goes back to that first scripture that I start out with. Don't let something have power over you. Right. I've never seen somebody take only one sip of alcohol, put it down, and say, okay, I'm good now. I'm good. I don't need no more. No, I'm good. No, they drink the whole thing. What? The one couldn't do it? I mean, why do we have to have the whole thing? And then it goes from one to the whole 12-pack. You know, then it goes to buying two packs. Then it's going. And even if you were to be the person that had one, because the Bible says that God's given us a spirit of self-control. Now, we know about uh, cultures in other places of the world where the water conditions are not good. And they still drink wine for dinner and everything else. And there's a lot of faithful Christians that drink wine in those cultures still to today. Yeah. Okay. Italy. Yeah. Big place. But they know, they have, the, they understand that they have the spirit of self-control. So if anything is going to be a stumbling block to my brother... Then, like the pastor says, you know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna witness to a Jew, I'm not gonna eat shrimp in front of them, <laughs> right? You don't have that. Becoming a stumbling block. Yeah. So, you know, God gives us. You know, Christianity is not about uh, intellectuality, but it's inte it's intellectually uh, intellectually defensible. It's not a dumb man's religion. Christianity is defensive. You could defend it. You could defend it because everything that God says in His Word is true. Yep. There's very little contradictions in the Bible. The contradictions are brought in by men. The dissensions are brought in by men. 
with their carnality, with the sensual, with the lust of the flesh. But if we obey the second commandment, it's to love our, our fellow man as we love God. We're not going to have an issue with laying aside a lot of things that no. just might be an issue to somebody else, but shouldn't be an issue to you. Yes, is that right? Yeah, um, as a kid, I seen a lot of drunkenness in my family, so I I couldn't stand it. So that's why I, you know, didn't drink. And you know, as years got gone by, uh, you know, my friends come over, I have a beer with them, you know, for like one, two the most. tell you, uh, I see what alcohol does to people. Uh, actually, my son, Christian, he lost his four adult teeth in his mouth from a drunk driver. You know, I, and I lo almost lost my ex-wife at the time. And uh, my uh, son, Dylan, the seatbelt out of the uh, seat, the seatbelt should save them all, but the airbag saved the two on the front. My son actually smashed his face on the, uh, the, the door panel and I remember the police officer gave me four adult teeth. He was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And this happened going to from a trick or trunk. That was a little trunk. The trunk the Halloween night. Coming from a church, right, that we were going to. And she was only doing 25 miles an hour. And a, and a, and a reckless drunk, he took a stop sign and hit them. All these little cars. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad they're alive, but I, I remember that day. You know, but, uh, Pastor, one thing I wanted to ask you, I... I I forgot where it was in the Bible, but a lot of people say it's okay drinking here. They use this one that they say, and I, I, I told the, uh, uh, my brother and sister over here, they always tell me, don't do an, ex an excess. It's okay, you could drink, you could eat a little bit, but don't overdo it. Like, don't do an excess. That was in the Bible. I forgot. Do you remember what verse that was in? But I'm not trying I'm to say that. Yeah, it is it around like the it is qualifications of a bishop or a deacon. Because everybody always joked, joked about that. I think it's under the qualifications where it tells one to abstain from and the other one not to do it in excess. Yes. And they joked about it. But um, I'd have to look into that, really. I don't know. Yeah. One thing to think about, though, and, and we'll, we'll close with this if, unless Nelson finds something on yeah, that. Yeah, I got something. Um, uh, because I, I, because, he, because he got you. I want to make sure. Right. I want to make sure. One thing to think about, though, okay, the whole reason of our spiritual walk, the whole reason of our spiritual journey, the whole reason of our spiritual formation, which is our sanctification period, because when we got saved, we became justified. We, until we get to heaven, it's considered a sanctification period, okay? That whole period is for us to help others. Okay, we're being formed in the image of Christ, not for ourselves. We're being formed in the image of, image of Christ to help other people. So if we go around drunk, drinking alcohol, when somebody says, I think that's wrong, and is it Christian? And being a stumbling block, how are we helping other people? Because our main goal, and I just did a, about a six-page essay I had to do today for class, and it was on the whole class, our spiritual formation is what the name of the class was, but the book was on spiritual, spiritual pilgrimage. With all different disciplines in the Bible and stuff, talking about solitude, silence, prayer, all it goes in great depth. But it all boils down to the reason that we go through all this and the reason that we're growing, the reason that we're striving for is for other people. What did Jesus do when he came to earth? To save that which was lost. What did he do in his entire ministry? Others. Did for others. He never did for himself. Very rarely did he do anything for himself. And most of that was going to pray. It was always about other people. So we have to think that in our minds that what we do in life is not for us, it's for other people. And trying to get them to go to the same place we're going. Do you find it nice? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. A key verse of the Bible, in my opinion, which every believer should focus on, is Psalms 119, 160. Highlight it if you can, please. Uh, the reason why is because 
if we take a text out of context, out of context, meaning if we take the text out of the message being delivered in that chapter and the book itself, including other books of the Bible, which is called text, then we run into false understanding of the scriptures. So look, look it says here in 119, 116, and I'm going to read it from the Amplified Bible because it explains it as he reads it. The sum of your word is truth, meaning the total of the meaning of all your individual precepts, of all individual, or every little bit and bit taken out from every book from the Old and New Testament. Okay. It says very clearly, and every one of your rights decrees endures forever. But the King James says it, the sum of your word is true. The sum of your word is true. So we could read sometimes one scripture saying one thing and another scripture saying another. And believe you me when I tell you, it's not that God is disagreeing with himself or either that he's a God of confusion. We must understand the subject and the context of what every word that we're reading is in order to arrive at the right conclusion or else confusion will come. To be able to interpret it, you've got to realize too, like we said before. I mean, what he said in the King James, it says, "Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever." The Bible says in, the, in in Revelations not to add to or take away from the Word of God. It says if we do that, plagues will be added, and our name will be blotted from the Lamb's Book of Life. That's where I can argue with anybody that believes once saved, always saved, because that is not true. If that was true, why would God put in Revelations that once you get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, which the only way that can happen is through salvation, and he's saying he's going to blot it? That means you aren't going. That means you lose your salvation. But it tells you how, so don't do that. But people will do that. They will take a verse out of the Old Testament that was written for the Old Testament and take a verse out of the New Testament written for the New Testament at that time, which is totally different than the Old Testament time, and make it what they want it to say it's okay what they're doing. I go to the verse that says in the Bible it says man will do what's right in their own eyes. Amen. Be careful. That's why I said work out. And I and I and I apologize tonight because I always thought it said search, but then I was corrected. Work out your own, not somebody else's, your own salvation with fear and trembling. And trembling. That's what we gotta ask ourselves. No matter what it is, it could be drinking, it could be drugs, it could be overeating, it could be doing this, it could be doing too much of this. Too. It could be not giving God time in your life because we're too busy with our own selves. That's a sin just like drinking alcohol. Okay, same thing. What's more important, God or ourselves? That's where we have to come down to the conclusion. So, same way with cell phones, sitting in church. Doing oh, this. I, 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 I have said it many a times that I have yet to find a cell phone in Braille. No. What does that word mean? Blind people, when they're touching that thing and they're feeling oh, no, because they're doing this, there is no way they're keeping up with the sermon because they do it in here. I've no, seen it. They're not listening to you. They're not. They're on their social media page because I can find out later what time you posted it and it comes on mine. If you're a friend, so yeah, there's no cell phone in Braille. So yeah, it's people. Listen, people are going to do what they want to do. We're not going to change them. To me, that's an addiction. It's it is that is a very big addiction. I wish, trust me, the world was so much simpler when we didn't have them. I just wish we'd go back to the pagers and the, and the pay phones. Can you imagine the lines at the pay phone for people? <laughs> and then nobody has coins on them. Yeah, nobody has coins. So they had to have a swipe your card. <laughs> But don't forget that Sunday at uh, 9.15 is prayer time. If you want to come pray with us, Sunday school is at 10, worship service is at 11. And don't forget Sunday night. You don't want to miss the, the um, tinsel hanging service at 4 o'clock. You will love it, I promise. Be much in prayer for Brother Nelson as he does the next two Wednesday nights. And then be much in prayer for Brother Roger as he does Sunday school on the 19th, okay? So um, lift them up in prayer. Be here to support them. Because uh, always worries when a pastor is off or on vacation and nobody goes to come to church. <laughs> but y'all are faithful, so I'm not going to have any worries. But, uh, what's that? 
We're gonna be gone too. Uh oh. I guess you had permission. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All hearts and minds clear? Yes. All right, Lord, we want to thank you for allowing us to be here tonight, Lord. We want to thank you for the information that, that we went over, Lord. And I just pray that you'll deal with hearts, Lord, on this. Because as, as we talked and as Brother Nelson read uh, that you put Paul in the Bible, Lord, we're not here to argue with one another. We're not here to argue your word. Lord, we're just going to stand on what you said. And, Lord, I pray that you'll just touch hearts, change hearts, if it be thy will. And Lord, I pray that when we leave here, you'll keep us safe as we go home. Let us get home to our places safely. Help us to be a blessing to somebody this week, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that when we come to church on Sunday or even before Sunday, Lord, let somebody get saved. Lord, I pray that they'll accept you as their personal Savior. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.